Hello and welcome to the Class Act Zoom Forum, Why Am I So Cranky, Sad and Worried? I'm Marion Dry, co-chair with Jonathan Sprague of Class Act H73. And I confess I have certainly been cranky, sad and worried in the last couple of months. For those of you who are new to Class Act, Class Achieving Change Together, we're a nonprofit organization of members of the Harvard Radcliffe Class of 1973 founded to address important local, national, and international problems by creating and supporting positive change. When the pandemic hit, we decided to create a public forum to provide our classmates and others with information that can help us navigate the cha changes and challenges we're currently experiencing. This is a complement to our ongoing work and a vehicle for staying connected while society is shut down. Tonight's forum is the third in a series of forums addressing the impact of COVID-19 on society. Two weeks ago, we addressed voter suppression and voting rights. And in March, Dr. John O'Quick, the director of the Rockefeller Foundation COVID-19 response and an expert on epidemics, talked about the pandemic. The challenge of providing mental health services in the US has been identified as a topic of interest in re a recent survey of classmates who have a professional background in health. This was a factor in the genesis of today's forum. But tonight is really about the personal. You know, when the flight attendant gives us instructions before we take off that we're supposed to uh, take the ox oxygen mask and put it over our faces before we help our children, so that we can be safe and they can be safe. Well, this forum is intended as an oxygen mask. Our panelists will help us think about the emotional issues we face and how to take care of ourselves so that we can be equipped to help ourselves and others. We're very grateful to our classmates, Dr. Patricia Potter, Dr. Robert Waldinger, and Henrietta Wigglesworth Lodge, licensed clinical social worker for sharing their knowledge with us this evening. Before our program begins though, we do have a little Zoom housekeeping. There are gonna be a couple hundred participants tonight. So to uh, make, facilitate things running smoothly, you are muted and your video is turned off. And we hope you'll stay that way during the course of the forum. We suggest that you use speaker view so you'll be able to see whoever is speaking at the time. You'll find the icon for speaker or gallery view in the upper right corner of your Zoom screen on your computer or in the upper left of your tablet. We hope you'll ask lots and lots of questions. We'll be using chat for this and we'll collect your questions and pose them to our panelists during the Q&A session after they've talked. If you have questions for a specific panelist, make sure to indicate that in your post. Check chat for links to relevant articles and websites that we're going to be posting, and we encourage you to post your own comments and relevant links that you have. You'll find chat in the middle of the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen on your computer, on your tablet. It's in the scroll down menu more at the far right upper corner. Please note that if you're dialing in, you do not have the chat function. Class Act is gonna be live tweeting and posting so on social media using the hashtag Class Act Forum. We encourage you to join in and retweet with abandon. But let's get started. With pleasure and with great gratitude, I now introduce our first panelist, Dr. Patricia Potter. Patty is a child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist and a, an adult psychoanalyst. She's on the faculty of the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and the Massachusetts Institute for Psychoanalysis. She has also been an instructor in psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. And thank you very much, Marion. Thanks for arranging this for all you do with Class Act. And thanks for Diana for turning me on and, and for Katie for working with us. I, I wish I could say I'm really glad to see everybody, but I really would like to wish I could see everybody in person. Um, but thanks for being here. 
I'm going to be talking as a psychiatrist in private practice. I approach understanding the impact of the virus and, and the isolation on mental health the way I understand people in my practice and in life, what I call the psychodynamic point of view. We all give meaning to what happens to us based on our past, our temperament, and the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We're conscious of some aspects of our responses and the reasons for them, but not all. I'm not going to talk about the impact of the pandemic on people with severe mental illness, though this is a terrible situation for them, cut off from the people and structure they rely on to find their way in the world, and perhaps stuck inside with people they have trouble getting along with. I'm going to talk about what's hard in these times, but most of us are coping most of the time. I've never known emotions to be discussed so frequently all over the media. Monday, I found four articles in the New York Times about feelings, and yesterday on NPR, they were even talking about the loneliness of eels. Complex feelings stirred up by the pandemic and social distancing or physical distancing, as people prefer, are a big part of what everybody's talking about. I'm talking about the vivid dreams people are having and even what the dreams mean, which are they're occurring in part because of anxiety and in part because there's less to distract us from what's going on in our minds. This is a dramatic time for all of us. I assume most of the people watching this forum have the means to shelter in place and some economic means, but we, but we are all still afraid. We're afraid for our health, afraid for the health of our loved ones, for our economic well-being, for the first responders, for the other people who help us deal with life, the pe people who are delivering things, working in markets, things like that. We're afraid for the state of our country and the world. Uncertainty is one of the most difficult things we're dealing with. And we're also dealing with loss, maybe of people we love or people we know in different contexts, but also the loss of our ordinary lives, as well as things we had been looking forward to. Big things like graduations, weddings, perhaps religious events, but also smaller things like plays or social get-togethers we've been looking forward to. We are sad not being able to see and touch people. And in this group, it's particularly true that many people miss seeing their grandchildren, miss hugging their grandchildren, and they worry, are their grandchildren ever going to really get to know them? It's very hard. A lot determines how any of us will respond to the situation. Some of it is a result of our past. People are afraid of, uh, to repeat things that have been traumatic for them. This is a threat to survival, and it evokes the memory of other threats, maybe of loss, of illness, other kinds of helplessness, or maybe even of violence. On the other hand, at least we know that we've been able to get through a lot. Our responses are also determined by how we respond to everything. Do you always try and figure out the angles so that you can be in control? Do you minimize danger? Do you look to find out who you can blame? Do you worry? Do you turn to alcohol or food to get through for comfort? Do you run? Any of these mechanisms may work part of the time, but, do they, but they don't always succeed in helping us hold the waves of crippling anxiety or sadness at bay. And sometimes we can overdo it. Chapped hands may attest to trying too hard to control things. Those who have always been anxious may actually have an easier time dealing with having to be so careful. And up to a point, those who are uncomfortable being in social situations might be relieved to be at home, but eventually they get lonely too. Some people now feel like others will know what it's like to be them, worrying all the time and being afraid or sad. Everybody's circumstances affects affect their reactions. Obviously, our reactions affected by our health status and our age, 
even though we would all like to believe we are not in that vulnerable group since we're so young at heart. But nonetheless, we are vulnerable. It can be especially hard for a person of color who has reason to be afraid of not getting the highest level of care or being looked at with suspicion while wearing a mask. If we're working at home, it may be helpful giving structure or a sense of purpose or an accomplishment, but it can be really frustrating. And if you're not still working, all the things that you've done to feel fulfilled may also be absent. Video conferencing or visits can be exhausting. And it can, it can be very lonely being home alone, but Bob will talk about the stress that being home can put on our relationships. Some people have told me they feel guilty because things are not as hard for them as they are for others. Some have always wished for time at home to tackle various projects, take up a hobby, or finally read that book. And some people have been very satisfied that they could do it. But other people are trying to do it and discover they can't focus or find the energy for more than just binge watching TV series. It can be hard to do things when you're too worried or sad or uncertain. It's important not to berate oneself and to accept feelings without self-criticism. That's my mantra long, long before this coronavirus. Also, each person has their own approach and it's good for us to try and remember that they're doing the best they can and we shouldn't be too judgmental. There are a lot of questions about how things will be for the next weeks, months, or years. There'll be losses which will require a long process of grieving and working through. And we may have to support people in our lives who've been on the front lines and may be haunted by the tragedy they've experienced. Thinking about going back out, we all wish for certainty. How do we know what's safe? What's safe enough? What will happen to us if we stay isolated? We all have to continue to work on our tolerance of uncertainty. And I hope we can support each other as we do so. And I certainly hope we will all be able to feel joy when we can once again experience the things that we're missing. So I'm going to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Waldinger, who's going to talk about what the pandemic and lockdown, of what effect they have on our relationships. He's a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and Zen priest, clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And he is the director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development, one of the longest running studies of adult life ever done. It tracked the lives of two groups of men for over 75 years, and it's now looking at the baby boomer children of those men to see how childhood experience reaches across decades to affect health and well being in middle age. He writes about what science and Zen can teach us about healthy human development. And many of us have been lucky enough to hear him as he participated in various symposia through the years at our reunions. So, Bob? Thanks, Patty. Um, and thank you all for doing this with us. Uh, I'll try to pick up where Patty so eloquently left off. Uh, if, if Patty's message isn't clear yet, what she has been saying over and over again is one size really doesn't fit all in this pandemic and in what's happening to us. And I think what I've been observing is that it's because our lives have been suddenly frozen and each of us is in a different situation. So suddenly we are frozen into closeness with people that we're not always so close to 24 seven and into distance from people who we sometimes have relied on to be able to see, to come and go. And each of us has a different mix of that. So nobody is in quite the same situation. Uh, too much closeness can be something that is a surprise to us. There's a, an old saying about marriage that I really like. It's for better or for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> this idea that we never signed up to be with each other 24 seven. Our relationships didn't start that way. We didn't plan on them being that way. 
So one of the things that is easy for us to do is to imagine that there's something wrong because this doesn't feel so great. It isn't bliss by any means. And strains in relationships often get more strained when we're together all the time without as much of a break. So one of the things you're all noticing is that we need to establish new routines and not to assume that there's something wrong with our relationships with the people right next to us if there's tension, if it's not easy. And of course, the other thing that we're noticing is that there's sudden distance from people who we rely on to be close to. And that can be everybody from the person you buy your coffee from in the morning to the person who annoys you in meetings at work, but they're your person who annoys you and you're used to seeing them. Uh, many of us can't be with our grown children. I have a son who's in New York in Greenwich Village in the heart of the pandemic. I'm really worried about him. And so many of us can't be with grandchildren, can't be present for the birth of grandchildren as we had planned on being. And as Patty was saying, you know, pandemics, like many national crises, generate in us fear and agitation. And in fact, in the pandemics of the past, when we read about plagues, right, it's one of the things we see, which is our human reactions to chronic fear and fear of each other. So what that can result in is the tendency to blame, as Patty was saying, blame ourselves and blame other people. The other thing that can happen is that we can spill over our agitation from worry about the virus and worry about what we read in the news and watch on TV to what's happening in our lives. So we spend a few minutes watching the latest dreadful report on CNN and then the next person we turn to in conversation is somebody with whom we're probably gonna feel a little more agitation. And so it's really important to recognize, literally recognize arousal and how that may shape our conversations with people, especially the people we're close to all day long. You know, as Patty talked about, there is grief. It's grieving, not just in the big ways, for people who die, but grieving for all those small things that we're not gonna get to have. Graduations, we're not gonna get to attend. So I think the, the final thing I would say is that the important thing is to think about your expectations for what this was going to be like. All of us have an idea of what it should be like to be home all the time, what it should be like to be in lockdown in this way. Um, you know, some people talk about, I, I know I'm gonna clean out my closets. I know I'm gonna get into better physical shape. Notice the difference between those expectations and the reality. And don't hesitate to talk about that with other people because I think what you will find, if you haven't already, is that everybody is surprised this isn't what we thought it was going to be. I mean, who would have dreamed that we would be in this situation in the first place, but that now our reactions are not what we would expect. And just to hearken back to what Patty says, none of our reactions are wrong. They're simply what they are and need, need to be acknowledged and managed. So with that, I'm gonna take us to our next speaker, Henrietta Lodge, who will take us to the world of children. Um, for those of you who don't know, Henrietta Lodge has recently retired from hey. her work as a school social worker. She was doing that for 40 years, working with middle school and high school students, their families, school staff. She's worked in public and private schools. She serves on the Putnam Northern Westchester, New York Regional Crisis Team and the Putnam County Suicide Task Force. She's also a member of Class Acts Communications Committee. So she's gonna have a lot to tell us about how young people are experiencing this pandemic. 
Thanks, Bob. And um, thank you all for this opportunity for me to talk about kids and schools. Um, I think that um, one aspect of this pandemic that has not been emphasized is the consequences of school, sc school closures that go well beyond academics. And as Patty said, we're in the age where we don't have um, school age kids at home. I think at least most of us don't, um, but we do have grandkids. Um, so perhaps you haven't been involved with schools in the way you had, have been in the past. It's important to understand that schools have changed in the past 20 years and that school personnel have increasingly become the frontline first responders for kids with social, emotional, and mental health problems. In addition to the way uh, academics are being presented during this pandemic, I wanna say that for kids of all ages, closing school means it's also a major shakeup in their worlds. Schools provide structure and routine and support in addition to academics, there are daily social and emotional challenges and opportunities to practice relationship building, learn about them what themselves and learn about each other. I want to make it clear also that if we're not directly experiencing the illness, as has been said, we're all experiencing increased stress, anxiety, and grief over the losses from COVID-19, and kids are too. They've lost things they really care about. Spring sports, field days, the school musical, the charity fundraisers they've organized, and of course, senior prom and graduation. They're worried about college admissions process, but most of all, and what they report they miss the most about school is lunch. And I'm not talking about the lunch food, I'm talking <laughs> about the fact that they miss everybody that they hang out with and socialize with at lunch. As Patty said, um, like the rest of us, most kids are resilient and have good families and good adaptive skills and effective support systems. So they'll be okay once we establish whatever the new normal is going to be. But very vulnerable to the isolation resulting from these school closures are kids with pre-existing and or emerging mental health diagnoses, including anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, <coughs> borderline personality disorder, eating disorders, bipolar. <coughs> um, it's the f we see at schools the full gamut of mental health problems. Up until February or March, schools across the country were having conferences and conversations about the increased mental health needs of students of all ages. And in school, when I was in school there, meaning working in school, there were constant concerns about kids not getting out of bed because they were too anxious <coughs> and depressed, uh, kids engaging in self-harm, acting out in uncontrollable anger and similar issues. School social workers, psychologists, counselors, and teachers are the first responders to kids' mental health needs. They're often the first to recognize that there's even a problem. And even with cooperative parents that have good insurance, mental health services for children and adolescents are inadequate. Students with needs for services, they continue to attend school, leaving the school folks to support them in whatever way we can. So that was already happening. And then came COVID-19 and schools closed. And as Patty said, for some anxious people and for anxious, some anxious kids, not having to go to school is a huge relief for them. But for the other kids, closing schools has, for many other kids, is they've given up their, or don't have access to their on, ongoing, daily, sometimes hourly, emotional support system. Trusted adults at school play a huge role for kids with mental health issues, even if they have a therapist or other regular mental health provider in the community. For kids without therapists, and there are a lot, school people are their only source of support. So during this uh, time of physical distancing, um, we can expect at, in their homes, they're being becoming more isolated there's more self-harm, there's more suicidal ideation, and support 
that they're used to having is not readily available. So in addition to those kids, another group of kids that concern me a great deal are kids that come from dysfunctional homes. In normal times, there are many students who regularly remain after school long after classes end because they don't want to return home to a place where there is emotional, physical, or sexual abuse or violence. COVID-19 has made us all cranky and stressed. The stress of the illness and or financial and food insecurity on families that were suffering from many things before the pandemic is going to make that family stress exponential. The pandemic has brought predictable increases in domestic violence, child abuse, and substance abuse among adults. But calls to child abuse reporting hotlines are way down across the country. And this is because as mandated reporters, school personnel do not have the opportunity to observe the signs and symptoms over the internet the way we do when we see these kids in person. So these kids are not getting the help they need. And finally, I have a great deal of concern about an often forgotten population in public schools, and that's students with intellectual disabilities or students with autism and other developmental disorders. These students are often in self-contained, employment-focused classrooms, and they spend most of their day learning life skills, from how and when to wash their hands, to handling frustration and anger, to ordering pizza, to punching a time clock. They thrive in the structured, predictable, and supportive classrooms. Often students have one-to-one -one aides as well as teachers that provide immediate feedback and direction, more often than not about social interactions as opposed to academic tasks. This constant and consistent feedback and structured routine is often not available at home. Parents are overwhelmed by increased meltdowns, increased aggression, and the ability to, um, the inability to provide the consistent routines that they know their kids need and want because of family obligations or they're working at home or other things are going on. These kids regress over regular school vacations. It will be really difficult to bring them back whenever they uh, do uh, to pre-shutdown level of interactions and behaviors when schools do um, get back in session. So schools are on the front lines of mental health, of emotional um, uh, disturbances and emotional and social interactions. And I believe that without these first responders, kids really are suffering. So I guess now the next thing to do is turn it back over to Marion for the, the next segment. Thank you all for your perspective. And um, we would really like to hear from each of you about some coping strategies uh, related to the things that we just talked about. Uh, as this crisis goes on, uh, it gets harder and harder for each of us. So uh, Bob, would you start? Okay, yes. So. Yeah, some coping strategies that we all know about, but what I'm finding is that it really helps for us to remind each other of some of the things that we may know but lose sight of in all of this change. So the first is that self-care is surprisingly important, that actually sleeping enough, eating well, getting exercise, not drinking too much, all of those things are incredibly important in terms of establishing a kind of physiologic baseline of well-being uh, that supports emotional well-being. So get out every day, make sure you move, make sure you do some things uh, to support your physical health because activity supports better mood. The other important thing is to pay very close attention to what you are allowing into your mind. One of my Zen teachers is fond of saying that, that what we let into our mind shapes our mind. And what I'm talking about is how we absorb the news. So if you find yourself taking in news a lot of the day, that's going to be agitating. Particularly visual media is designed to agitate us. It's designed to keep us hooked. So 
curate what you put into your mind. Ideally, read the news and read it from the most trusted sources. Go to the CDC website for information about the pandemic. Um, do not look at screens in the two hours before you want to go to sleep. So be sure and be sure not to look at news late in the evening because it's bound to be agitating. Um, you would be surprised at how easy it is to lapse into taking in content that's going to agitate us. In terms of the problem of too much closeness, I would just say that we need to remember to give each other more space than we're used to. So my wife and I uh, work all day. She at her desk, I at my desk, and we don't see each other much. We get together for dinner and we literally ask, how was your day? Even though we're in the same house all day long. Same with our 28 year old son who's here with us. So what that means is giving each other more space than we're used to. That does not mean there's a problem in the relationships. That means that's what we need. The other thing is that for these problems of too much enforced distance, reach out to people, be more proactive than you might usually be. So that if the thought occurs to you, oh, I wonder how so-and-so is doing, act on it. Let, don't let those impulses pass without doing something about it. And finally, notice when you begin to feel so anxious or so down that it's really getting in the way of your life. And think about reaching out for help. Uh, people are doing lots of good mental health care virtually. It's available. And so don't hesitate to re reach out, perhaps through first through your primary care doctor or through uh, a friend or a colleague. Uh, I make referrals all the time, uh, as I'm sure does, Patty and Henrietta do as well. But don't let yourself shy away from getting help if emotional distress is getting in your way. So now I will turn it over to Henrietta, who's got some tips for the kids in our lives. Thanks. Um, well, I think key, and it's already been said, but I think it's worth repeating, is the first thing is that the adults in kids' lives need to take care of themselves in all the ways that Bob talked about. And the analogy that Marion used as putting on the oxygen mask before we put the oxygen mask on to kids um, is, is a really good one. Um, kid, adults need stability in the, I mean, well, we all need stability, but kids need adult stability in their lives and adults that will model good ways to uh, handle stress. Um, Obviously, I think communication is really important with kids. Uh, it's important to recognize that, um, that their lives are equally as stressful and anxiety-ridden as ours, and remember that they don't um, have the tools yet or the experience yet to, um, to, to handle it as well. I think that as grandparents, we always think of grandparents as being totally non-judgmental. So I think that if you grandparents reach out to your grandchildren and ask them, how are they really doing? You know, uh, that would be an important thing. Bob has already mentioned limiting news and social media exposure. Um, that's really important. Of course, kids are on the social media much more than we are. Uh, it's important to talk to them about how much they're using that. Um, structure and routine is good. And then, it, you know, urging them to get outside, um, doing some mindfulness exercises, um, anything to, to calm themselves down. Also, kids love taking action to help. So it, things like um, uh, writing cards to nursing homes, um, doing other kinds of crafts and things. Action will bind the anxiety and kids really want to make a difference and, and they can. And finally, the, the thing that I would uh, add is as parents or as grandparents to expect more acting out, more meltdowns, misbehaviors, and isolation on the part of kids. This is a really hard thing for them to be going through. So some of it might be a normal reaction to it, but trust your instincts. 
if you really think that your child is in deep trouble, as Bob said, there are people available to help you out and um, help is still available um, over the internet and through hotlines and such. So um, Patty, can you add to any of that? I don't have so much to add. I think that we're all on the same page um, about most of it and the importance of self-care in, in all those ways. I think one of the things that comes up as people talk to me about their kids is you have to accept that you can't make it all better. Right. And, um, you know, and I, I think it's really helpful for me to help the parents in my practice do that, as well as with the kids in my practice to just say in whatever way I can think of, yeah, it sucks. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the first week, every kid I was then talking to most of the kids I had, I, I mean, with don't want to do it by video. I don't know why, but they all said the hardest thing is not knowing what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And kids, you know, who don't even talk about their feelings much were able to say that to me. And I think that's the advice that we have to give to ourselves too, to accept that this sucks. I mean, not all the time, but it can be really hard and we can do the kinds of things that help us feel better, but we can't make it all better. And we're not at fault for that. We shouldn't, oh, feel good. We shouldn't feel so guilty that we have it better. We should just accept how we feel. I, um, and I also add to the need to, the importance of being able to ask for help from, you know, maybe from, from friends or family or professional help um, as we need it. But I certainly think it's so important, as it was, everyone was saying, to stay in touch with the people that we care about. You know, I've been sustained through this whole period by my family and friends, many of whom are actually here today and not even all of whom are in the class of 1973 but we want to hear from the people who are here who are in the audience and what they'd like to talk about more well with that i will start asking you all questions and henrietta i'm going to start with you thank you all who are listening um for your wonderful questions and i'm going to read them to uh, to our group here. Um, Henrietta, uh, we have a question, and it reads, I have an adult child who is in important ways is fine. She's a lawyer, has plenty of work, but she lives alone and has no partner. And my husband and I worry about her mental state after a long time alone. We're across the country, Zoom regularly, talk on the phone, send email, but what, what else can we do? She has not asked for help, but agrees to have dinner, with us remotely most days. The reopening of her office is another two weeks or more away. Comments? Well, my thought would be um, to ask her how she's doing. You know, come right out and say, we're very concerned about your isolation and, and, um, and the fact that you're alone all the time. How are you handling it? Are you doing okay with it? You know, and begin the conversation. Um, that would be my first thought. Um, how much do the, does she reach out to friends uh, in, in her uh, neighborhood or in her area as opposed to being across the country? I love that you have dinner with her once a week. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> does, does he, uh, Bob? Yeah, I just want to say that um, this is really important because one in four people in the United States lives alone. I mean, that's a huge percentage of people. So we really do have to Kind of figure out how do we how do we help people to get what they need in terms of social contact during this time um, so just want to just want to call that out as a as a big big issue for uh, twenty five percent of us great um, this is a question that I think all of us are uh, can relate to and this is I find the state of politics in the US around COVID-19 to be upsetting and a source of anger do you have any advice for how to have a healthy engagement with political news <laughs> mm. 
Huh. That's a good one. <laughs> I, I, I have something to, to offer instead. So some of you may know Tim Shriver, uh, who was head of the Special Olympics for many years. And he has started on a whole effort called Unite. And it is trying to uh, get people to have conversations across divides, across political divides, across cultural and ideological divides, and to structure, he's calling them peace talks. And I urge you to go to his website. He did, uh, he did a 24-hour call to unite live stream with Oprah and George W. Bush and Hillary Clinton and just all these people. And they basically uh, made the case for um, how a lot of the way forward is not going to be through politics and through being glued to the political situation, but trying to bridge these divides in other ways, in much more personal, local ways. Diana, could you try to find that and post it on the chat so that people have access to that information? Um, and this is a question for Patty. Patty, accepting our unique personal responses sounds great, but I think it's easier said than done. How can we work on being gentle with ourselves and finding self-acceptance? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, I think that we have, first of all, we have to be committed to it. We have to learn to recognize when we're not being kind to ourselves, to notice what kinds of effects we, even what we feel in our body, that there's tension and to get used to being able to ask ourselves what's going on. I feel that actually even with the anger question, when you see yourself fuming, you think, well, how much, how helpful is it to really be watching all of this all the time? And, um, and, and as I said, I think recognizing the agitation and, and asking along with being committed to the kinds of things that Bob and Henrietta were talking about in terms of taking care of ourselves in, in all kinds of ways. Um, that's, that's the start. I mean, it's not easy and it's part of what can be really helpful talking to other people. And sometimes, you know, we can, we, I find myself reading articles all the time that say, oh yeah, that's right. I mean, this is grief. So, um, but it is something, an ongoing process to aim for. Bob, a question related to your comments. He writes, I have experienced a particular concern relating to, the ex to experiencing this as a dress rehearsal for retirement, which isn't far away, a year or two, but for which I was not ready. Any wisdom or insight on that situation? <laughs> oh God, I think about that a lot. This is not a dress rehearsal for retirement <laughs> because in retirement, there will not be a dreaded disease threatening to get us all <laughs> at any moment. I mean, hopefully in another year, we'll have a vaccine and, and it will be safer to be out and our mobility will be different. So the, the difficulty is that if retirement is being locked in your house all the time for weeks on end, uh, none of us want to sign up for that. So I think the thing, you know, I, I really resonate with your question because I keep thinking, oh, this is the new normal. And I have to keep reminding myself, this is not normal. This is, this is going to pass. And that I, I should not make any judgments about my life uh, extrapolating from what's happening right now. Okay. Here's one that just came I, I, in. Can I, can I respond to it? You bet. Respond as well since I am recently retired in June and one of the, um, just this past June. So it, one of the things that I said last spring as I was preparing to retire was that the last thing I wanted to do was to spend 24 seven with my husband. So, <laughs> so this is not normal retirement at all. <laughs> and and um, it's, it's, it is not the new normal. And although retirement, it has been much more of an adjustment than I thought it would be. 
um, this is not the way retirement is going to be. So, and I appreciated Bob's um, thoughts about not not being 24. You know, the the thought about not having lunch. You know, better or worse, but not lunch. So, we're managing though. <laughs> Uh, here, here's a question at, from someone who lives in Canada. I am curious about the magnification of stressors at this time in the U.S., with the focus being so much on the economy and political posture. In Canada, the mantra, mantra here in B.C. has been, be kind, be calm, be safe. All together as a frontline physician, still working a lot, I am very concerned about the problems people are having getting their priorities right health or money, family or business? I want to move there. Because <laughs> like, it is so clear, you know, that that, that kind of, if, if there is a kind of motto that's really got traction in British Columbia, you know, be kind, I can't remember what the others were, be calm, uh, be, be safe. Be kind, be calm, be safe. I mean, imagine if we could have that mantra coming from <laughs> leadership, really. And there are some leaders that are doing a really good job of trying to do that. But we really need, we, that, I think that's one of the things that people are longing for. Uh, and it sounds like they may be getting that, at least in British Columbia and maybe in Canada in general. But I think it is a, you know, it's it's why we we look to leaders in times like this to be the compass pointing us in the direction we need to go. And so, yeah. yeah. Patty, sorry. Yeah, but but I think also, I mean, embedded the next part of the question was about the complexity of what feels like black and white choices, and I think we we also have to accept that you can't have you know, health versus family versus finance. You need to figure out how to balance all of those things because they're all crucial. Yeah. It shouldn't be either or. Mm -hmm. um, one person asks if, if you could comment on what to eat. Is comfort food really your best, our best friend? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I would say you, you should accept your wish to eat some comfort food as long as you don't over to it. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, it's pretty Aristotelian. And, but, but, and, oh, go ahead. But I was reading some, some reliable information today about obesity being a risk factor yes. for yeah, doing poorly if you get the virus. So as Patty says, don't enjoy, enjoy but don't overdo it. Right. Same with alcohol, if, if you're able to, to have some without overdoing it. So, so these are, are two, well, here's two related questions. And any advice for parents and grandparents of elementary school age children who do not have special needs but seriously miss their friends, hate homeschooling and worksheets, and are acting out like they've never done before? Right. <laughs> Henrietta, I think that must be yours. Well, well I, you know, I, I, I've had some experience with elementary kids, but um, certainly one of the um, resources I used, um, and I believe it's on the, on the website or on the chat, is um, there's a number of really good uh, articles about talking with your kids about COVID-19 um, from the National um, Association of School S Psychologists, um, NASP, N-A-S-P. Um, but in terms of friends, that's a that's really a tough one, you know, because you can, they can't be relied. At least elementary kids, or probably any kids, can't really be relied on to keep the six foot distance. Oh, hi, kitty! <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I knew they'd make too much noise if I locked them up. Mm. <laughs> but um, so so zoo. I mean, Zoom birthday parties. I my. Um, brother who lives in Alaska has school-aged children and they arranged for a tailgate party where everybody went to a parking lot and sat in their cars with the tailgates open and were able to see each other and chat with each other and stuff while maintaining social distance. But um, it's a really tough one. It's a tough mm -hmm. one. Um, 
So uh, here's a question. How common is it to imagine that you may never be comfortable again being in close proximity to scores of other people? Mm -hmm. I, I, certainly people are talking about that. Um, but I think what we know historically is that that goes on for a while and then it, then the fears subside that gradually we come to understand that it's okay. And so you will, you know, people will, will come out slowly and test the waters. Uh, but I think we have to be prepared for people to be frightened for a while. And we're, some people are going to be more frightened than others. And so some people are going to race back out, you know, and other people are going to hold back for a long time. So, so changing in a different direction, this person writes uh, some, she'd like to hear more, or he'd like to hear more about financial fears. Uh, this person is not in, in the class of 73, but is concerned about managing your own finances and those of an elder and feels overwhelmed. Gosh. I'm no expert on finance. I mean, yeah, we're all afraid of um, financial, if we're involved with the stock market, we're watching, we're watching that or not watching it. Um, it's, um, I think it's a common thing. And particularly with people that are losing their jobs and, and will they have a job waiting for them when they come back? It's, it's pretty tough. It's a tough situation. You know, one thing I might suggest I mean, in, in mental health, like when, when we were trained in mental health, one of the mantras is never worry alone. And my thought for, for this person who's managing his or her own finances and a parent's, which is a big responsibility, right? That maybe there is someone you could reach out to, to talk to, um, to get some thoughts, just to make sure that things are on the right track so you don't feel all alone with this responsibility right now, because it is a big responsibility. I mean, I've, I've had to reach out to my financial advisor and, and he's been saying, don't do anything right now. And I just needed someone to tell me that, but at least someone who knows more than I do to, to say, it's okay, just sit still. And, and so I, my hope for you is that you don't hold all this responsibility all by yourself. And don't blame yourself if things are bad. Mm -hmm. Right. Another question, how do, how do we encourage, uh, especially young adults who think that mental distress is a sign of weakness? I think that um, that's happening less and less. I think more and more people are realizing that mental health um, is uh, really, and problems with mental health is, a, is an illness. It's not a weakness. And, and it can be managed and um, more and more people are willing to uh, talk about the struggles that they have. And certainly I, I know that um, with kids in school, that's, that happens. But, but I also feel right now that that dis the distress people are feeling even intensely is not the same as mental illness. Right, right, so oh, yeah. whatever image you have of a kind of lifetime of deterioration, that, I mean, the fact that you're so upset now doesn't mean that's where it's going. Absolutely. And we have a question that's for, uh, about people who are suffering in a very different way from the way most people who are on this call are. What is your advice for populations and people who are dealing with food insecurity, no health care, therefore no medical and issues of physical abuse, et cetera? Um, and, and so the, I think there's that question and there's the, the other question about how do we um, approach that to be helpful? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm aware of just wandering around Cambridge and looking at next door is that there are people who are at least trying to do, to be available, to help, to give, to give food. You know, the restaurants are making food for homeless and food insecure people. 
there's signs all over about do you want help? Um, so, I mean, depending on the community, there are some, some resources available and people who really want to be able to help. I think also, oh, I, I was going to say that I, it, to separate out how can we help now versus the long-term impact, uh, you know, of lack of health care and all that stuff that, that we, um, we can get involved with politically um, as well. But in terms of um, actual help for this pandemic, there, are, there is help available. Um, uh, that people can find in different communities, whether it's volunteer organizations or food pantries or whatever. I also just want to add that, you know, most of us listening here or tuned in here um, have resources. Most of us are fairly privileged. Um, and if we can, I, I would just urge everybody to think again, if you can possibly give more now, give more of your money. Like, you know, we are at the high risk. So it's not like we can, I can't be in an ICU taking care of COVID patients. Now I'm too old. They don't want me there and I don't have the skills. But one of the things, and there are things I can do material, physically, but one of the things that we've been doing is giving as much money as we can to relief organizations locally. And I, so for example, we said, well, you know, often it's at the end of the year, like in December, where we'll give some of our annual gifts. We're giving them now. And I think just to, just to call out to all of us, and of course we all are struggling and our own finances are less secure than they used to be. But even so, if you can lend your material resources to this crisis, that, that seems to me to be one of the best ways that we as a group of 69 year olds can, can help. Another thing is the people who have counted on us for their livelihoods. Like, I'm not comfortable, ha I will reveal my privilege if someone cleans my house every week and I haven't wanted her to come in, but I pay her every week. Yeah. I haven't yet pay given money to the person who should have cut my hair three weeks ago. But, you know, that's other, there are other people like this all over. And, and you know, it's, it's money that we ha had already planned to spend. So, you know, we can, I mean, that's a local way to support people. Yeah. I think we have run out of time, but I want to thank all of, all three of you for your wisdom and, and everybody who asked questions for your questions. Uh, this has been very helpful to me, certainly, and I hope to others as well.